So, good morning. Here comes Gloria. Um, so, Dr. Sankis is with us again today, and will be with us again next week for his final presentation. Flying <clears throat> from Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, had nothing but good feedback from people that attended these sessions. And we really appreciate all the time and effort that you've spent preparing for these. Um, Michael, it's really been great. So today he'll be continuing on his uh, presentation of From Temple to Table. Next week, he's gonna change things up. He has a special interest um, in the crash or the nativity scene. And this presentation will touch upon the upon Michael's own contribution to the art of the church by way of his activities as a designer, fabricator of original three-dimensional large-scale nativity scenes. So that should be pretty good. I'm looking forward to that, Michael. And oh I've, already got, I've already got a question prepared for you on that, but I'll hold up. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Sure. Michael. Thank you, Dale. How's everyone doing today? Are you all doing well? <laughs> Is it is it looking like autumn in Manhattan Beach? Uh, Not really. Palm trees don't change. <laughs> oh, I see. Now, Kevin, do I push share screen now, or should I go to PowerPoint now? Um, open your PowerPoint first, and then share screen. All right. There's PowerPoint. Uh oh. Now, how do I get back to? <laughs> then you can go back to Zoom, and then top, and then share screen. Now, how do I do that? By going here, and um, then sharing. I can actually see what sounds right. Right there. There we go. That looks like me. That looks like my stuff. Huh? There you so go. From the beginning. There we go. Yes. Fantastic. It's great to be with all of you again. Can you hear me okay? Yes. And you can see me, and I can see all of you, which is fantastic. That's the way uh, teaching should be done. Um, as you can imagine, I, I spend my week thinking about you when I'm apart from you. And uh, again, maybe that has to do a little bit with transference. I, I always fall in love with my students uh, because I think that learning and education is uh, so, so important. Leonard Bernstein used to say that teaching is the, the noblest of all professions, probably uh, poor in terms of its compensation, except for the fact that uh, we teachers uh, do care about our students and and like to think that we're uh, we're sowing seeds and so forth. And teaching is sort of a prophetic activity anyway. Um, we're preparing here in Erie, Pennsylvania for snow in the next couple of days. Uh, I thought you'd like to know that. I don't know if I told you the first time we met that uh, Erie is sort of halfway between Cleveland and Buffalo. Pittsburgh's <laughs> about an hour and a half south of us. And so we get the lake effect snow that you learn about on the Weather Channel all the time, but, but we Erieites know how to drive in snow and plow for snow and all that kind of stuff. Today, however, it's an absolutely beautiful mid-October day in Erie. Here's a photograph I took about 45 minutes ago of the office in my home, our home, where um, I'm um, talking to you from. And uh, it's just so beautiful outside. The leaves are all beginning to change. Uh, it's now in the mid 40s and 50s in the course of the day. And uh, even when I went to mass this morning at nine o'clock, already uh, all the autumnal and October uh, connected uh, symbols were, were in, in place. Um, I told you, I think the first time we met that I worship in a contemporary church building designed in the 1970s. And um, I really enjoy, in fact, uh, worshiping in a space that is forward looking contemporary and I'll be telling you a little bit more about that in the future. Uh, Dale, for your benefit, and in response to the question you asked last time about crucifixes and crosses and all that kind of stuff, I took this photograph immediately after mass um, in my church building, our church building, uh, St. Jude the Apostle Church in Erie. And it's that, that image of the resurrected Christ that I mentioned offhand uh, last week, just before we began the sort of the meat of the discussion. Uh, and of course, it, it is a, a, an image of Jesus, the Christ, um, the, the resurrected Christ, right? He's, he's already defeated the cross, which is why he kind of floats above it. And there's the, those airplane uh, cables I told you about that suspend Christ that way. And even though he's defeated death, he's defeated um, the cross, uh, 
you, you can't see it very well in this photograph, but if you could somehow hover there or uh, yeah, hover around the Christ, you'd find that he's got wounds in his hands and his side and his feet. He's a resurrected Christ, but he's still marked by death. Um, and let's be, uh, let's be, uh, um, let's, uh, let's be on, uh, let's be accurate about describing resurrection. Resurrection doesn't mean resuscitation. I mean, we, we call an EMT or somebody to re resuscitate somebody who's passed out. That's not what Jesus's resurrection was all about. When, when, when Jesus becomes the Christ, the anointed one, he destroys death completely. He, he turns death inside out. And, uh, and, and that's why you and I don't have to fear death. Through baptism, you and I get to die ahead of time. And that's so liberating to us. You and I don't have to live in fear because we've already died to this world. We've already died in Christ. We've already put on Christ, as St. Paul says. I was thinking about that as I sat next to the gentleman you see in this photograph who sits on a wheelchair. I think he's a Vietnam vet, but I'm not sure about that. And maybe it probably wasn't too right for me to be photographing him during Mass, but I thought, I wonder what kind of consolation he takes from the fact that he's worshiping uh, with the help of Christ who also has a, a body that is broken, but a body that is also changed through the resurrection that we all believe in as Christians. One of the things I want to do today to kind of wrap up our discussion, and, and you folks probably have figured out already that I'm really tinkering with these lectures, these presentations. They, they don't just happen. I spend a lot of time during the work week um, tailoring th these to your needs and what I've already learned about you as the community at uh, in Manhattan Beach. I want to talk about the fact that we as Christians, regardless of our denominational uh, traditions or denominational imaginations, share so much in terms of history. But of course, the thing that used to break my heart when I taught undergraduates and even graduate students um, for 35 years is that so many of them hated learning about history. I used to hear the same refrain all the time. Dr. DeSantis, I don't like history. I hate history. It's so boring, which I can never quite understand. But I think it has to do with the fact that we've never really taught history very well in this country. I think the same thing holds for math. We, we never really taught math very well because you folks all know that if you get to the higher realms of math, it's such an elegant, beautiful language, if only poetic language, if only we could get there. Most of what my students had learned in high school and junior high was chronology. And by that, I simply mean, as you all know, memorizing a lot of names and dates and wars in chronological, in a chronological scheme, chronological order. Um, a friend of mine who taught history used to call that the, um, the manure and gunpowder approach to history, right? Memorizing one war after another war after another war. But I was always quick to tell my students that if I did my job well as a historian, I would tell them stories because that's what history is truly all about. Many of you know that in the Romance languages, the word for history or storytelling and the word for uh, story the stories we tell each other are identical. And uh, storytelling, the way you know somebody like um, Ken Burns does it, or Stephen Ambrose, or even the, the late David McCullough, we're all sort of mourning the passing of David McCullough. Those folks were great storytellers. And what they understood is that every story that we tell to each other, the stories that sustain us, every story has the capacity to be moral and also mythic couple of words that I probably need to define. Morals are great because uh, uh, they, they describe a pattern for living, a pathway that we can take. Uh, you've all heard the word more or uh, cultural mores that has to do with a pattern. And, and storytelling gives us patterns that we can follow as human persons to kind of keep us out of trouble and, and to make our lives livable. Um, even the little stories I used to tell my children, my four kids, when I would read to them at night, always had a moral at the end. And the moral of the story is, and they could apply those morals to their own little lives, their young lives. History also has uh, the capacity of being mythic. And this is a word that I used, um, I think, last week or maybe the week before in our discussions, or maybe twice, both talking even about Christian history, 
And you get into a little danger sometimes when you use a word like mythic, because in our popular Amer American imagination, we think of a myth as being something that's not true. Uh, Santa Claus is a myth. The Easter bunny is a myth. But that's not the way the, uh, the Greeks, for example, who gave us the word, understood myth. Mythos or myth means a story, and it can be an absolutely true story that points to something larger than itself, It points to something beyond itself. And I'll give you a perfectly good example of what I'm talking about. And I chose this because it happened right in your backyard, right? And as Dale just confirmed a couple of minutes ago, on that Friday evening, a bunch of decades ago now, we all watched O.J. Simpson drive around the L.A. freeway right through Manhattan Beach, right, going south in that white Bronco that became so, uh, so well known. I was, you know, on the East Coast watching the thing in real time and uh, imagining what folks on the West Coast were going through. But even though that's a historical event, it's a factual historical event, the, the OJ Bronco chase, and then the trial that we all uh, experience together, these are historical events. It's amazing how that story took on a mythic proportion. I mean, it even there were even words connected to it or phrases connected to it. I'll go back a second. Remember the phrase we all learned? Uh, if, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Or at the end of, of, of the OJ trial, we, we looked at the story surrounding it and, and the moral of the story was, you could have everything and not have anything at all. Poor OJ sort of stored all of his treasures in the wrong place and he lost it all, though he had so many tremendous gifts and opportunities. Jesus understood the importance of storytelling and parable and poetry. He, he, he always taught as a, as a rabbi, you know, his followers called him rabbi. He always taught dialogically. He taught in terms of dialogue. Uh, folks would give him a question and he'd throw a, a parable at them. What's the kingdom of heaven going to be like? Well, there was a man who had two sons. And we all love the story of the prodigal son. I, I always associate myself with the older son who's in that window there looking jealously at his young brother. And he's looking jealously because the father figure who doubles for God, our father, is so incredibly loving of this son who has broken his heart. And uh, such a gesture of intimacy goes on here in this depiction of the story of the prodigal son, where the prodigal finally learns uh, about his own sinfulness and returns to his father's house. They, they embrace each other. And the neat thing about this is that we all apply this to our own lives. We're all conscious of the fact that Perhaps, especially in our youth, we were all prodigal. We all wanted to do our own thing. We lost our way and then realized that we really wanted to be in the, the presence and the embrace of our divine father. I love the way Rembrandt depicts that story. I bet you've all seen uh, reproductions of Rembrandt's classic depiction of the story of the prodigal son from the book of Luke. Sometimes, and maybe this is unfair, uh, we describe Rembrandt as the first great Protestant artist, because I think Rembrandt would probably say, I'm an artist first, and I happen to be Protestant, although he wouldn't even have used that word. But I, I love Rembrandt's depiction because we have, again, the prodigal returning to his father, um, asking for forgiveness, and the father embraces him with those fantastic hands that we see. And some of you maybe have even heard this detail already or know a little bit about art history. And so you know this to be true. I, I think it was actually Henry Nouwen, uh, the great spiritual writer and uh, a, a gentleman in, in, involved with the, uh, the L'Arche community that you might even have in Manhattan Beach. Nouwen was one of the first people to um, point out to us that if you look at the hands of the father, and of course the father is a symbol for our divine father, his hands aren't equivalent, are they? See how the hand on the right hand of the screen, which would have been the father's left hand and the hand on the left side of the screen don't seem to be equivalent to each other. One's fatter and more muscular than the other. Well, in fact, what Rembrandt did using his imagination, we'll talk about that word in just a second, was to, uh, to give this, this father figure, this symbol for God the father, 
a masculine hand on one arm and a feminine hand on the other. This God of ours, of course, brings together in a complementary way both, both the feminine and the masculine. The masculine representing the law, which I suppose a lot of us could become preoccupied with. We love to excommunicate each other <laughs> based upon the rules of the law. And yet we have this incredible God figure who who's willing even to break his own rules, his own laws, in order to convey to us mercy and grace and forgiveness. Uh, I love looking at this painting um, and have always loved sharing it with my students for all of those reasons. And of course, I just use the word that's kind of intriguing, but sometimes scary to people, because we like to think that religion somehow is cast in concrete and that Perhaps as Christians, we like to believe that on the evening before he was crucified, Jesus gave us a long prescription of everything we need to see in Christian art and architecture and informed us that we had to have stained glass windows and steeples and all those other kinds of things. And all that Jesus ever gave us was bread and wine and the command to wash each other's feet. You talk about Monday Thursday in some traditions. It's a mandate that we are to serve each other. Imagination is important because you can't have a disembodied religion, as I might have said off the top of my head the last time we were together. I suppose you could do philosophy all of your life or, or be theological all of your life, but in order to really live the Christian message, you have to embody your creed, your faith in images, even if they're intellectual, mental images. The word imagination comes from the word imago, uh, in Latin, which means image making or image or icon, icon in Greek. We, we are an iconographical people, or as I used to love to tell my students, human beings live by their symbols. They, they live by their images. Think about something like the Statue of Liberty. And you folks on the West Coast, maybe you've had a chance to visit it in New York City and New York Harbor. Maybe you haven't, but you still kind of live your lives based upon the sort of thrilling message or narrative that this statue made by a French artist renders or gives to us. You might remember that uh, about 35 years ago, almost 40 years ago now, the Statue of Liberty was in really bad shape. It was literally delaminating and the steel, the metal was falling off, the, the bronze was falling off. So they put Lee, Lee Iacocca in charge of a committee responsible for restoring the statue. And I know a lot of folks would probably say, well, why would you spend millions of dollars on a stupid statue, a su stupid symbol, when in fact there are poor people all over the city of New York who are impoverished, who have no homes? Well, I like to think that a symbol like the Statue of Liberty allows us to or motivates us to, let me get rid of that thing, whatever that is, allows us to uh, to take care of the poor on the streets or to feed the poor. It inspires us to do that. And, and imagine now what the Statue of Liberty means to all of us, given the fact that it's no longer bracketed by the profile of the Twin Towers of Yamasaki's World Trade Center. In the old days, when you would fly in New York Harbor, you would see the Statue of Liberty framed by those twin columns. And of course, even today, our hearts are broken over the fact that those columns and the 3,000 people who died in them on 9-11 are completely gone. Think about the imagination of somebody like Michelangelo Bonarotti. And I've got to tell you that Michelangelo was probably among the most popular of the artists I talk about in my classes or used to. Maybe you've uh, been lucky enough to go to Rome, to uh, the Vatican, St. Peter Basilica, and you kind of go right through the narthex into the nave. You you turn a, a right and you can see in the side chapel this incredible work of art called the Pietà. It's hard to translate the word Pietà into English. Many foreign words can't be translated fully into English, but you see how even in terms of its uh, spelling or its graphic presentation, the word Pietà is related to piety, which means prayer, and also pity or mercy. And I suspect that what Michelangelo wants us to experience in the presence of this work is a desire to pray to God, our Father, but also to understand something about his mercy. And uh, of course, we sort of imagine Michelangelo as some old geezer carving this thing late in life. Well, he, he was 23 years old, which humbles me even 
even today as I as I looked at this work of art. Uh, 23 years old, and yet he's got the capacity to turn a, a chunk of Carrara marble into human flesh and bone and sinew and tissue. Nobody, of course, at the time could have believed that a 23-year-old Florentine could have carved this thing. Folks used to look down their noses at the Florentines, especially in Rome. So what does Michelangelo do, do as some of you know? He steals away into the, the chapel where this piece was kept late at night, and he carves that banner across the breast of the Madonna. And on it, he carves the words, Michelangelo the Florentine made this. Pretty amazing. I think I would do the same. But keep in mind, keep in mind how um, he's not creating a scientific mannequin, right? He's not interested simply in science. Although one of the reasons I used to love to share this with my students was to simply prove to them that that science and art, that faith and reason are complementary to each other. You can't carve a piece like this out of Carrara marble without having a scientific imagination, without being left brain. But Michelangelo is also right brain. So he goes beyond scientific or logical accuracy. And we have this figure of the Christ. And uh, what does it look like he's doing in the lap of his mother? Anybody, even if it's obvious? What's he kind of look like? Looks like he's sleeping, right? And that's consistent with Michelangelo's creed or imagination. He believes in the resurrection. And somehow this Christ figure who doesn't have any of the rigor or rigidity in his body that he possibly could have or should have, this Christ is sort of uh, sleeping in the lap of his mommy, his mother, which in Michelangelo's Catholic Renaissance imagination is the church itself. Mary is a surrogate for the church. She's a symbol for the church. So here's the Christ lying across the lap or the altar of the church in his mommy's arms. And, and look at that mommy. That You know, I keep calling her mommy, and you might think I'm um, being condescending or desecrating the image, but, you know, the Italians refer to her as Madonna. She, she's, a, she's a maiden. She's a mother. Uh, she's a maiden because she's never had sex. She's the Virgin Mary. And again, we look at that face and we realize that it can't be logical at all. It certainly isn't scientifically accurate because we all know that uh, Mary was a teenager when she conceived the Christ child. We get a sense that Jesus was about 33 years old when he was uh, crucified. So you do a little arithmetic, you add 33 to the age of a teenager. This can't possibly be the face of a middle-aged woman. But that, again, is consistent with the imagination of the man who carved it. He's a dyed-in-the-wool Renaissance Roman Catholic. Roman Catholics, as you all know, believe in something called the Immaculate Conception, which is an idea that is so misunderstood among Christians that it breaks my heart again. It, uh, we, we so misunderstand each other's uh, traditions that we love to discount each other or excommunicate each other. Most Christians, if you, I suppose even most Roman Catholics, if you were to survey them, would think that this phrase refers to the conception of Jesus. Somehow he was miraculously conceived by the Holy Spirit in the belly or the womb of a woman. Well, well that's not true at all. Only obliquely does this refer to Jesus's conception. This refers to Mary's conception, because in the Catholic imagination, Mary is conceived immaculate. She doesn't have the stain of original sin that our souls apparently have or traditionally are described as having um, as a response to the offense of Adam and Eve. You might say, well, where the heck did Catholics get that idea from? We'll go back to what we said last week. If God the Father wanted to entemple himself in that ark, in the, the Ten Commandments, the, the first covenant that we find in the temple in Jerusalem, why in the person of Jesus, which represents the, the new covenant, why wouldn't he want to be in temple in a, in a structure, a person, an architecture, just as beautiful? In the Catholic imagination, it's this figure we call Mary. And of course, you all know Italian men and their relationship with their mothers, right? Uh, Italian men love their mothers. And uh, Italian Catholics love to refer to the Christ child as il bambino. He's a true infant. He's a true baby. Those of you who are parents uh, can understand what I experienced by raising my own four kids. Our babies, our infants are so forgiving of us. I know we like to talk today in pop American culture about how 
children are resilient and so forth, but they're also incredibly forgiving. No matter how many mistakes I made with my kids as a parent, they forgave me and they forgave me and they forgave me and they forgave. And that's the story of the incarnation. God comes to us as an infant, a bambino, like us in every way except for sin. He has this intimate relationship with his mother, who's a maiden. She's a virgin. She's a Madonna. And, and you see how in this painting by Raphael, a contemporary Michelangelo, you've got Mary reading the word of God. She's contemplating uh, on the, the word of God day and night. And that word, the gospel, becomes her baby growing in her womb. That, that baby forgives us infinitely over and over again. This Christ figure forgives us for our sins and saves us from that sinfulness of ours. Some folks like to say, well, Michael, it's kind of fun to hear you talk about all this Catholic imagination stuff and all this sacramentality. And uh, we, uh, we Protestants certainly don't indulge in any kind of Marian tradition. Well, again, we, you have to pause and, um, and look at history to realize that that's not necessarily true. Some of you might recognize that this is a photograph taken in the town of Dresden in Saxony in Germany, where they have recently spent hundreds of millions of dollars to restore this wonderful church building called the Frauenkirche, which literally means a church dedicated to the Frau, the, the wife of St. Joseph, that's Mary. This is a Marian church um, reconstructed now in Dresden, Germany, those of you who are history buffs will remember that during the Second World War, the Allies just knocked the hell out of Dresden, right? We firebombed Dresden as payback for what happened in Coventry. And we can talk about the politics and the morality of that some other day over coffee. But the people of Dresden since then have been refabricating this incredible building, which they recently rededicated. But the kicker is that this is a Lutheran church, a Lutheran place of worship. And um, though we, we associate Lutheranism certainly with the very beginnings of the Protestant tradition, and what a great building. Look at this structure. Look at that, not only the pulpit that you have to climb up to and the, the, uh, the uh, chancel space beyond it, but there's actually a baptismal font that some of those folks in the foreground of this photograph are congregating around. Uh, this is a Lutheran place of worship, but still dedicated to the Virgin Mary and to the kind of significance that she has in our, our history, our story, storytelling about the Christ figure. I like to think of this as a wonderful embodiment of architectural imagination, but it's also simultaneously, because you can't disconnect the two, an embodiment in brick and stone and mortar of our liturgical imagination. From the very beginning, Dale's been doing such a nice job interview, uh, introducing me at referring to me as a liturgical designer, a liturgical consultant. Someday I'll tell you a little bit more. In fact, next weekend, I'll tell you a little bit more about how I inherited all this liturgical blood from my grandfather who lived to be 100 years old. And as a liturgist, a litur liturgical designer, I'm preoccupied with this Greek word, liturgia, which is the phrase that the earliest followers of Jesus came up with. Some of you are familiar with metallurgy, which is the chemistry we use for working with metal and strengthening metal. Well, liturgy, which comes from a couple of Greek sources, means working with the people, the work of the people, the worship of the people. And the people, of course, that it refers to is us, the people of God. Now, it, it might also find, you might also find it kind of interesting that um, most of what I preach to congregations across the country when I'm doing this kind of work is um, parallel to what uh, Martin Luther would have believed 500 years ago. And that's something to kind of tuck into your heads and, and ponder this coming week as, as you think about the kind of ecumenism that uh, I like to share with congregations and to bring up uh, as part of these presentations. Even if you think simply of the uh, sort of the core beliefs that Martin Luther tried to uh, promulgate throughout the northern part of uh, Europe, beginning in Germany, justification by faith alone, right? A bedrock idea that Protestantism would have clung to, that we don't save ourselves through good works. It's a completely gratuitous uh, process based upon grace. Justification by faith alone, sola scriptura, the, the authority of the Bible, 
You can't necessarily trust the governments of men or men and women, so you have to trust the divine word of God. And finally, in, and in my imagination, my mind, um, for somebody interested in church architecture, the priesthood of all believers by virtue of our baptism, by which Luther literally meant all believers. And um, you might remember that in the final minutes of the game last Sunday, I left you with this image, which kind of depicts what Christian architecture looked like by the 16th century when Luther comes into our story. You've got the laity on one side of an elongated uh, church space. They have no chairs, because as we're going to find in a couple of seconds, a chair is always in our Western tradition, a symbol of hospitality or a symbol of authority. Well, the lay people weren't extended either of those things during the Renaissance period, the Middle Ages. You had the clergy divided from them by means of a big old thing called a rood screen. And uh, as I used to like to tell my story to my uh, students, it's kind of like when you and I were young and we were celebrating um, important uh, events in our households, like Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter dinner, all the adults were sitting in the dining room and they had the Irish linen and the china, and they ate, you know, beautiful silverware. And you and I and our brothers and sisters and our cousins, we were all stuck in the kitchen eating from paper plates with plastic cutlery and so forth. The church sort of patronized those of us who were lay people. And uh, we, we often talk about how, how it is that in Germany, the people were so literate that Martin Luther was able to cap capital, uh, capitalize on that and to give us a, a Vulgate version of the, uh, the Bible, to give us a, a Bible in Latin. This is actually an altarpiece. Altarpieces were these big billboards that were built above the, the mensa or the tabletop of an altar up until the time of Luther. This is one in Wittenberg, where Luther spent so much time, that shows a depiction of the Last Supper looking very much like one of those Christian house churches that I shared with you a week ago, where people are drawn together in a, a communal style. Uh, look at John the, John the beloved disciple. He's always falling asleep on his master's lap, and we see him there falling asleep uh, on, on Jesus's lap. When Luther comes into the story, Catholic architecture looks something like this. You'd have a big old plan, a big old rectangular space, where the lay assembly would gather, and at that time, believe it or not, folks were encouraged to bring their pets to mass with them. It's kind of like when you go to France today, for example, and you're in a fancy restaurant and dogs come up to you and cats will come up to you. And even parts of the States today, you're allowed to bring your, your pets into that fancy place. The lay people, I kind of put these little red blobs here in the space. They had nowhere to sit, as I said before. They had to stand throughout the entire service, or sometimes um, there would be uh, benches built into the walls, and the elderly were encouraged to go to the bench if they uh, grew tired. Uh, the altar was at the far end, typically the eastern end. Uh, these buildings were always oriented. They literally faced the orient. They faced the east. But as a layperson, you really couldn't see very well because, as I said last week, there would have been a big old structure called a rood screen. The word rood means a, a cross, a rod. And I suppose you could sort of peek through the central portal of the rood, but it was difficult to see over that space. It was, uh, in fact, impossible to see over that space. Uh, you probably won't remember this, although I should test you on this and give you a test later on. Uh, uh, one of the reasons I took you to a Roman basilica last, last time was to show you that Christianity borrowed the idea, stole the idea of this big old picket fence, this big old uh, structure that uh, spanned the nave of, of a basilica and prevented lay people or for people from moving uh, longitudinally through that space. That became the root screen that we see in these Christian places of worship. And because the lay people couldn't see very well, except when they peeked through that portal I just showed you, it eventually became fashionable in Catholic circles for the priest, the presiding priest, whose back was to the people, who was offering this sacrificial gesture to God, it became fashionable for them to do something called the elevation, the elevation of the Eucharist. Uh, in fact, we actually have historical records that lay people would shout over the rood screen. It'd say, Father, Father, 
hold Jesus higher, hold Jesus, we can't see him. And what happens, unfortunately, is that liturgy goes from being a verb. At, at, at church today, this morning at nine o'clock mass, we had the story of the, the dinner at Emmaus. The apostles come to understand Jesus in the breaking of the bread. It's, it's a verb, it's an action. Instead, what happened during the Middle Ages, since the lay people had no active participatory role in the liturgy, they came to fixate on Jesus in the bread, the bread as Jesus's body. And we uh, scholars like to use the word ocular communion. If only they could see that little sliver of bread held above the priest, which in their minds, they don't even perceive as bread. It's the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus himself. If only they could see that little sliver of bread, that little disc, somehow that would allow them to gain uh, salvation. You can understand why a Protestant would say, well, that's simply a, a, a work. You're trying to work, your, work out your own salvation. In a Catholic uh, place of worship at the time of Luther, the clergy would be up front in the chancel or the sanctuary. And I could have sunk the word choir in here as well, because the only people who were allowed to sing or intone the parts of the mass were the clergy. I mean, this is why we still robe our choirs today. Uh, you folks robe your choir there in Manhattan Beach. That's a remnant of the idea that the first Christian choirs were made up exclusively of men. Um, the, the presumption being that that lay people, lay women and lay men certainly weren't worthy of intoning the parts of the mass. You can understand how angry I get as a Roman Catholic because I love to sing and I sing in the Erie Philharmonic Chorus. We're doing the Beethoven Nine next weekend. And uh, I resent the fact that the church told us as lay men and lay women that we don't have a right to participate in something, a mystery into which we've already been baptized. Speaking of baptism, um, well, the, the pulpit, I'm sorry, the pulpit would have been there because some preaching had to take place. But what I was about to say is that baptism was sort of a peculiar sac uh, sacrament or ordinance or gesture during the period and was typically done outside of the context of the Sunday service. It was often hidden in a little um, cupboard or, or um, closet, um, sometimes actually bap baptistries and baptismal fonts are incorporated into a building outside of the church structure itself. Well, what does that have to do with Martin Luther and how church architecture has evolved in the past 500 years since the, um, the, all the great innovations of the uh, Reformation period of the 16th century? Well, what Luther and his generation of, quote, Protestants did, and I, and I hate to use that word Protestant because I think it even it just gets in the way nowadays. And you, you call an Episcopalian a Protestant and you're going to get a black eye. They don't even think of themselves as Protestants. But for lack of a better word, during that Reformation uh, period, uh, we have the development of what, of what are called hall churches, or what in German we still refer to as Hallenkirchen, or hall churches. The development of something called a hall church. And what's so, so interesting about these buildings to me is that first of all, we recognize that Luther did not throw the baby out with the bathwater, which is the great cliche you so often hear. And you folks know as well as I do that Luther wasn't intending to create any kind of revolution. He was such a good dyed in the wall, uh, mool, uh, pious Catholic that he just hated the, the, uh, the uh, hypocrisy of the church. And I, um, as a Catholic scholar, I have to be very candid in addressing the fact that by the 16th century, a heck of a lot of huge errors had entered into the body of Christ, the Church of Rome, and that there was a connection between polity and piety. Polity has to do with the political managerial organization of a body, and piety has to do with the way people prayer, pray. Well, there were all kinds of abuses, as you all know, that crept into the church at the time. One thing I wanted to show you, even in this slide, is that the uh, the vaulting of these uh, these late Gothic buildings were such that the side aisles, the two aisles that you see there, which were appropriated from the basilica, and the central aisle, were all of the same height. And whenever you do something like that architecturally, even today, whenever you sort of try to flatten out or equalize a ceiling plane. And remember how the first week of this little presentation, series of presentations, I told you that the English word ceiling is an approximation of the word cielo, cielum, uh, 
it means a heaven, uh, architectural heaven. Whenever we put a flat surface or a uh, consistent surface above the heads of people, it turns the space into an acoustically correct, acoustically alive sort of hall. And that's where we get the concept of the Lutheran Hall Church, the hall space, which is still influential today. What do you have in a hall church? Well, first of all, you see those gray bars that I placed in my, my plan this week? That's where the assembly would sit, the body of Christ, which is the reason why we still call the entire space in which Protestants gather sanctuary. The body of Christ is there by means of baptism. We've all been in, incorporated into the body of Christ. He's there in the people who are sitting beside us, not just in the sacrament or the ordinances celebrated in the chancel. There's also a pulpit there because preaching is so important. The pulpit is literally dragged into the nave space. The word nave means a ship, and this is the ship that's going to get us all into the heavenly Jerusalem. Into my little plan, I popped a, a baptismal font, and I'll give you some value-added stuff. This is kind of cool. How many times have you gone into a place of worship, whether it's Roman Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, and seen a baptismal font that's eight-sided? Or how many of you have been lucky enough to go to Florence, right? You see the incredible baptistry there, it's eight sides. You go to Ravenna on the Adriatic, eight sides. Well, why is it that Christians ever came up with the idea, the imagination, that baptism has something to do with eight-sidedness? Well, it has to do, as some of you know, with the fact that, um, that math is, is a symbolic language. So often our human words get in the way when we try to describe mystery or God's presence in our, our world. But you can always rely on math because math is so pure. Well, first of all, we have to keep in mind that when the Romans used to bury themselves, they would do so in mausolea or graves that were either round or eight-sided. And in the Roman imagination, a circle and an octagon were thought to be equivalent. An octagon was defined as a circle with eight sides. I know that's kind of peculiar, but okay, yes. so we've got, we've got death symbolism. We have burial symbolism. But all, and keep in mind the fact that uh, when, we, when we are baptized, we die to this world and we are resurrected. We come out of this, this womb of water, this aqueous environment. That's why we often refer to in our Christian language as the, the baptismal font is both the tomb and the womb of the church. We die in this space only to be resurrected through the person of Jesus, the mystery of Christ's life in, in us. But what else? So let's go beyond that. Um, we know that from the book of Genesis, God created the world in six days, right? On the seventh day, he rested. And it was perfect. I mean, the universe was perfect. It was sinless. And then Adam and Eve, our ancestors, kind of ruined everything by bringing into this biosphere the sinfulness and the preoccupation with ourselves that, that, that we suffer from even today. But on this, the eighth day of the week, which is Easter Day, a day that kind of exists outside of space and time, God recreates the world through the death and resurrection of his son, by, through the resurrection of his son. Uh, Christ turns all of reality in, inside out, turns it on its head, re, re-sanctifies it. Now, that might be lost on us today, but the earliest Christians, when they saw an eight-sided font, instantly thought of the resurrection. Again, it breaks my heart that that's lost on most of us as contemporary Christians, but it's part of our history. It's part of the fossil record of who we are as followers of Jesus and needs to be spoken of. In my little plan here, I put the choir up front. I didn't put the word clergy there because now women as well as men, lay women as well as laymen, are given the privilege of proclaiming God, proclaiming the word through the texts of hymns. And I just love Protestant hymn singing. I used to tell my students that one of the great gifts that Protestantism, Protestantism gave to the West was the tradition of hymn singing. Now, it's true that Catholics sing hymns, but nobody does it better than Protestants. And I love the fact that apart from praise services nowadays, there, there's a definite theological thread that goes through all the lyrics, all the words of a hymn, wonderful theology that unfolds. The point is, though, that this choir now is made up of lay men and lay women, as well as clergy who are intoning the word of God. 
And uh, the space might look something like this. This is a sort of a historical example of a well-known uh, hall church. This is uh, in Annaber, Germany, in Saxony, in, in Germany. Uh, uh, you can see how the, the pulpit uh, has been brought way out to the middle of the nave space. You actually have pews now, which acknowledge the fact that the laity should be comfortable. And of course they have to be comfortable because now they have to be accustomed to really long sermons. Christ being present, right? Christ being present in the word. And I love the fact that the, there's a canopy above the, the pulpit, not just to um, help acoustically, it directs the sound outward, but whenever we put a tent, a canopy above something, we indicate its sanctity. And you and I talked a great deal the first time we were together about tent symbolism. Some of you have been to Jewish weddings and the event takes place beneath a tent. You go into a Catholic worship space, there's a tabernacle that's a tent. And look how in this building you can see the baptismal font up front. It might be a little bit difficult for you folks to see it, but, and it's right in line geometrically. It's on the same axis as the Lord's table, as if to indicate that those two sacraments, which are primary in Lutheranism, baptism and the sacrament of the Lord's table, are connected to each other somehow. This is a Protestant uh, early Lutheran uh, hall church that I particularly like. This is in Salzburg, uh, 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 Germany. Um, no, excuse me, Strasbourg. This is St. Thomas Church, uh, uh, again, with a, a, longitudinal, a longitudinal design this time, but uh, pews looking forward, pulpit in the middle, and then a, a space where the choir is able to gather around the altar which has been pulled into the crossing space. And then you see that large baptismal font there, uh, large enough, enough to uh, almost uh, accommodate the, uh, the baptism of, of an adult, but, uh, but not quite in that tradition. And of course, Lutheran architecture even today uh, carries on this patrimony, this tradition. As you all know, I'm not really teaching you anything right now that you don't already know. Some of you are, might be former Lutherans. If you go into a Lutheran place of worship today, you're going to find a, a, a nave space where there is seating for the assembly that allows people to gather around the table of the Lord. You'll find the baptismal font in a very conspicuous space, as well as the Lord's table. If we're talking about Methodism, kind of a 19th century outgrowth of some of these traditions we're looking at, you'll also find a way of gathering people around the central um, appointments of the chancel space. Um, some of you might know, even looking at a photograph like this, that there was an interesting phenomenon that developed in the 19th century called the Akron Plan. Uh, it came out of Akron, Ohio, as the name implies, that uh, allowed the assembly to, to congregate in a sort of semicircular space and even in the plan that I just popped into my PowerPoint, you can see that beyond the wall of the chancel are all of those classrooms that were part of um, Christian education for uh, Methodist communities. We all know that if we go to a Presbyterian worship, uh, place of worship, and of course, Presbyterians might have a slightly different form of, of polity, of political organization within their community. They nevertheless have spaces where the uh, assembly gathers around the central appointments. The chancel or choir area is in, in fact uh, tiered so that people can see easily as they perform as leaders of the assembly and participants in the assembly. The baptismal font is visible, the pulpit is visible, the Lord's table, those major appointments are visible to everyone. Even if we go uh, like to the south, for example, where huge Baptist spaces like this are being constructed today. We still get the vestiges of what Luther was talking about way back in the 16th century. And uh, of course, the megachurch tradition is a little bit different. We'll have to spend another 10 weeks talking about yeah, what, yeah. The, Ameri what yeah. the American megachurch is all about. I, 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 you know, I, I think I'm pretty open-minded and I embrace a lot of traditions. I'm not quite sure I fully understand what a mega church is. And uh, we'll, we'll have to discuss it some other time. But here's the kicker. Here's the monkey wrench I wanna throw in our discussion today. You're looking at a church space that I was actually involved in, in helping to design. They were one of my clients. This is a Roman Catholic place of worship. 
And that blows the minds of both Roman Catholics and Protestants to whom I show this photograph. This is what the building looked, back, looked like back in the 1960s when it was constructed for a group of nuns in Erie, Pennsylvania. It had the glue uh, laminate uh, trusses that you have in your own church in Manhattan Beach. It had kind of a interesting stained glass windows and so forth. But by the 1990s, it had become kind of rough around the edges and uh, it was time for a renovation. So we turned it into this experience, this architectural experience from, from the opposite direction. If you and I were to walk into this space um, uh, on, on which the appointments had been placed on a single axis, if you and I were to walk to where you see that, uh, that grand piano back there, well, let's go forward. It would look something like this, looking back toward the, the, the front entrance. Pretty radical, you'd say, for a bunch of Roman Catholics, even Roman Catholic nuns. The, the plan for this space looks like this. The, the altar and the what we call the ambo or the pulpit are on the same axis, which, which proclaims to Catholics that the word of God and the sacrament in which we encounter Christ have an equivalency, they're connected to each other. And by the way, in the Catholic imagine, imagination today, you really can't have a liturgical imagination or liturgical activity without also having an ethical or social activity, right? The Eucharist should transform you and help you serve the world around you. This is a pretty radical space, except that it certainly goes back to the earliest phases of Christian liturgical practice. And even though in Roman Catholic uh, circles today, we still uphold the idea of a, a male priesthood or exclusively male priesthood, uh, these gals who are part of the Benedictine community in Erie, Pennsylvania, certainly feel as if they have access to this altar table. In fact, it looks like a table, doesn't it? It doesn't look like a sarcophagus. It's not heavy and ponderous. It's not simply referring to the death of Jesus. It really is the table that we connect to the very first Eucharist on, uh, that Jesus gives to us so many years ago. Uh, one of the reasons why this building looks the way it does is that it happens to be uh, the church for the community that this gal belongs to. Uh, this is Joan Chittister, the woman that you see talking to Oprah. And some of you actually may have read some of the very prophetic writings of Joan Chittister, who is kind of an act of, of nature. I wanted you to see, though, that Joan Chittister, who is a, a Roman Catholic nun, has the initials OSB after her name. That means the Order of St. Benedict, because we're going to find that it's the Benedictines, uh, Benedictine communities throughout the world, that really radically change the face of Catholic architecture. Uh, just one more example of some of my work that I've been up to recently. This was a renovation project of a church that was built in the 1950s. The vaulting isn't particularly attractive at all, but you can see what we did. We kind of built a runway or an extended predella or bima platform on which we put the altar. The altar has equivalence with the ambo or the pulpit because word and sacrament are inseparable. The presiding priest sits in a chair. The chair is always a symbol of either hospitality or power, authority, or both. And then a huge baptismal font in the back, because believe it or not, and many Protestants aren't conscious of this, the Roman Catholic Church today prefers, prefers that adults be baptized by immersion. Uh, you have to really sort of die to yourself and go into that basin of water only to be reborn out of this womb, this aqueous environment. And even the church where my wife Kelly and I worship, this is where I took you to earlier, is uh, built in 1970, looks forward in the way that it gathers people around a central altar, a central table, and allows people to see each other with their peripheral vision. When we come together around the table of the Lord at St. Jude the Apostle Church, we feel almost like that first generation of Protestants who were doing the same things in their buildings. But that raises a really interesting question, especially given the fact that we who live by these denominational boundaries today are so quick to um, kind of throw each other out of the body or excommunicate each other. Here's the question I wanna uh, sort of ponder today. How did Catholic and Protestant worship and architecture come to resemble each other so closely? How did, how did that ever happen? It wasn't supposed to happen, was it? Well, in Catholic circles, it begins with a story that uh, originates in the 1830s. 
There develops in these great Benedictine and other monastic communities all over Northern uh, Europe, uh, a real fervor for liturgical prayer. And by that, I mean something other than devotional prayer. You and I can, can worship by ourselves and Jesus encourages us to, and we can pray in isolation devotionally, but liturgical prayer is always uh, communal. It's always uh, out, out in the open and it's a communal corporate form of prayer. At, um, at a place like Maria Lock, sorry about that, in Germany along the Rhine, a monastic community, they had one of the largest libraries in the world. And a lot of those books, maybe thousands of those books, have to do with the history of Christian worship. And around the time, the 1830s, a lot of archaeological information was being revealed to help Christians of that period understand what the earliest worship was like. To their credit, the monks who ran this church and would invite lay people to worship with them began to devise something called the Volksliturgie in German, Volksliturgie. Uh, we all know that Volkswagen, Volkswagen means a, a car for the people, right? Well, Volksliturgie was liturgy for the people, which I always find to be a redundancy because liturgy is the worship of the people. They also developed something called the dialogue mass, which is exactly what it sounds like. The priest would say something and the folks would respond aloud, kind of an antiphonal prayer, uh, a dialogue prayer, the way Jesus would, would teach dialogically. They did something similar to what uh, Martin Luther did. They began publishing uh, catechisms and guides to worship that they handed out to people to educate them. They understood the importance of of, of, of being teachers of the, the didactic aspect of, of liturgy. And even though it was true that at the time, liturgy remained very uh, highly ritualized and the elevation of the Eucharist, as you see in this uh, Baroque church, uh, was still very important. There were changes that were taking place at the time. Uh, the kind of mass that was being celebrated in the early part of the 19th century was still called the Tridentine Mass. Sometimes you'll find that today. That's just a fancy reference to the Council of Trent. Council of Trent was a big old council that the Catholic Church held, as some of you know, in the 16th, 17th century to, to respond to the challenge that the Catholic Church saw in the body of Protestantism, is the, in the, uh, the changes being made by Protestants. Uh, the dismantling of churches, for example, or the, uh, the changes taking place within Catholic churches that were being whitewashed, where the pulpits were being brought forward, and where it seemed like the lay people were just sort of taking over everything. It sent shudders through the, the Catholic Church at the time, especially the, the clergy of the Catholic Church at the time. And even when I was a little boy, let's jump 400 years forward, in the late 1950s, early 1960s, I, I'm, not, I'm 65 years old, so I'm a child of liturgical reform that's happened in the Catholic Church. But when I was a little boy, the Catholic Mass still looked pretty much as it's depicted in this photograph. Men, exclusively male group of people in this sanctuary space, wearing elaborate vestments or fiddleback chasubles and strictly divided from the lay people, uh, typically divided by, by a vestige of the rood screen we talked about called the communion rail or the communion railing. Sometimes the clergy would try to con us into believing that uh, the communion rail was an extension of the altar. Well, I never bought that even as a kid. I saw it for exactly what it was, a way of dividing one class of Christians from another class of Christians. But here's the interesting thing, the surprising thing. All the way back in 1928, there was a German architect, again, along the Rhine, influenced by these Benedictines and these other monasteries, who carved out a space in a chapel at a beautiful castle where he allowed the clergy and the lay people to sort of gather together around the altar table. Uh, it seems to me that that has a one-to-one -one relationship with the early Christian house churches I showed you folks last week. And then let's transport ourselves here to the States. Let's, let's bring that liturgical reform here to America. There's a university and an abbey, a monastery in Collegeville, Minnesota, still very important today, that is uh, populated by Benedictines. The charism of Benedictines is liturgy. That is their concern. 
In the 1950s, with the help of Marcel Breuer, great contemporary architecture, they put up this chapel building, this church building, made out of poured concrete and beautiful glazing and contemporary materials, the plan of which brought the clergy and the assembly closer to each other, gathered around the table of the Lord. I, I look at this building and I realize the extent to which the architect of, of our church stole most of the good ideas that are present here. And look at that beautiful canopy, that tester, that tent that he puts above the high altar. But at this time, in the mid-50s, architecture itself was changing. And some of you sitting there this morning in Manhattan Beach might be engineers or architects, and you can attest to this. The way we were doing architecture, the feeling among architects, the incredible enthusiasm American architects especially had for modern uh, changes in architecture were important and we need to acknowledge them. If nothing else, architects were beginning to realize that we had a whole spectrum now of new materials and methods that would allow us to express our imaginations differently. And, and in this regard, I think about something that like that great TWA terminal in JFK. I don't know, Dale, if you ever flew in there or worked in there at all, but uh, uh, Aero Saarinen's incredible uh, TWA terminal that recently has been converted by the jet blue folks, but you look at this building and it represents what it means. It represents what it means to fly. It's, it's a building rendered in an abstract way that talks about flight itself. Well, if you can build an, a, a, an airline terminal this way, why can't you build a, a church this way? And around the same time, you've got Le Corbusier building his incredible chapel in Ranchamp a wonderful building that looks like a great billowing tent. I wonder where you got that symbolism from. Uh, architecture was being spread by the way that we uh, publish it today and the way we talk about it today. And architects were beginning to look more and more enthusiastically at modern ways of approaching architectural expression of the sacred. And then in the midst of all of this, something happens in the Catholic church that is very profound. A great council is called between 1962 and 1965 that we still today call Vatican II or the Second Vatican Council. And as I might have told you the first time we were together, in addition to the 2,500 Catholic bishops from all over the world who were invited to participate in the council, non-Catholics, including Protestant clergy and even agnostics and atheists were invited to participate in this great hammering out of a plan for living our lives as modern people. Because after all, in the mid 1960s, we were only two decades removed from the terrible events of the, uh, the early part of the 20th century, the, uh, the middle of the 20th century. And, and the question becomes, how do we go on being Christians or Catholic Christians after the Holocaust? Imagine how we had torn apart Europe and it might be fine to think that our Catholic mass remained intact, but all of Europe was physically destroyed, morally, psychically destroyed. How do we go on blithely celebrating the mass, thinking that somehow that has any connectedness to the world? Even more so, think about what happened in, in August of 1945, the incineration of countless uh, thousands of people in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. How do we go on blithely being Christ in a nuclear world. Well, the Second Vatican Council, the bishops of the world said, first of all, we have to go through a major phase of aggiornamento. That was the word that was used most often. That Italian word was used most often by the council. All those curmudgeonly uh, Catholic bishops who came together for the council. You see how that word has the word giorno in the middle of it, giorno, which means day. Well, aggiornamento means to update to update the church. We've got to do something to make the church relevant to the 20th century. And one of the people behind us was actually the Pope who convoked the council, this wonderful old jolly Pope who's now a saint in the Catholic tradition, John the 23rd, who was from Venice. He, he never missed having coffee and donuts, I think, during his entire life. And he said, let us, he said famously, let's throw open the windows of the church and let the Holy Spirit blow through it, you know, which is just a wonderful image. Uh, another word that was used by the council was a fancy French word, recensement, which simply meant going back to the source, 
let's go back to the source of what this church is all about from the beginning. And you all know who that source is. It's not a what, it's a who. It's Jesus Christ. And what was Jesus really trying to say to us on that Thursday evening before he was crucified? In a document called the Pastoral Constitution on the Modern World, the Catholic bishops of Vatican II said, the joys and the hopes and the griefs and the anxieties of the people of this age are those of our church, right? They said the church must read the signs of the times and preach the gospel in a way that makes sense to the people of today. And I'm not telling you anything that you don't personally understand. I watched you folks very carefully last week. I watched you worship. Your choir made really uh, went to great lengths to make sure that it had all kinds of colors, right? You look like uh, parts of a rainbow. And I think that was the, the point, wasn't it? I listened carefully to what uh, Pastor Mike had to say. And it was quite prophetic, quite moving. He said, we are they and they are we. Just as the bishops of Vatican II said, we are the world and the world is us. We have to preach to the world, minister to the world. Mike also said, Christians take risks to love boldly. And that's just part of our DNA, which I found very moving and very prophetic too. I, I sent him an article uh, by email. You can find this online, by the way, an article that I had written a couple of years ago. It's called Lessons from My Two Years as a Gay Catholic. Now, I happen to be a straight man, but I lived for two years in grad school in an apartment house that uh, mostly uh, rented to gay men. And the point is, I learned a great deal about the prejudice that was directed toward my, great, my gay friends, gay and lesbian friends, while living in that space, and try to think that that somehow tempers my own work. What did the uh, Catholic Church say about liturgy with regard to all of this stuff? Well, the goals of liturgical renewal from a Catholic perspective were these. First of all, we've got to build architecture and create liturgy that allows for the participation of the entire assembly. Well, that's right out of Luther's book. Secondly, they said that when we build places of worship and we come together around the Lord's table, our worship should be signified or characterized by noble simplicity. Right? We're not out to impress, but to express who we are as people, as Christian people. And this is the most difficult challenge to Catholics, even today. We have to recognize that there are multiple modes or multiple ways that Christ is present to us in worship, not just in that little sliver of bread or non-bread, but also in the word, in the community, and the presiding priest. And of course, all of this was happening here in the States during the civil rights movement, right? Or the protests against the Vietnam War. And I have to tell you from personal experience, having viewed the way my parents and grandparents were reacting at the time, that the typical lay Catholic went to mass on a Sunday morning in the mid 1960s, just terrified of what was going on in the world and hoping to get some peace and quiet in their churches. And what was happening? The very same thing that was happening in the 16th century in Lutheran communities. The altar railings were being turned around, turned out, the, the altar was turned around so the, the, uh, the presiding priest could actually see the people. It was terrifying for uh, folks of my parents' and grandparents' generation. Youth culture was taking over the activities that occurred in church, and we had guitar masses and balloon masses and clown masses and motorcycle masses and all those kinds of things, as the Catholic Church grappled with how to be meaningful to uh, the world around us. And yet this has been really the, the bedrock of my own ministry to people across the country of all different denominational stripes in the publications that I write in uh, the, what I try to preach to uh, congregations like yours. I have an article, by the way, in this month's uh, copy of Worship Journal that's published by the monastery in, in Minnesota that I just told you about. It's an article called An Architecture of Pardon and Consolation that tries to talk about uh, what the Vatican, Second Vatican Council was trying to achieve. Uh, in that article, I have an illustration of this church building that I helped design. This is in Hiawatha, Iowa, which is hard to say. Wonderful church building constructed about 10 years ago that I bet any Protestant congregation would probably find familiar or attractive. Or this one in Bowling Green, Kentucky, 
where uh, we have kind of a wonderful complement of color, texture. This is Holy Spirit Church, by the way, which helps explain some of the iconography of that far wall. But again, in terms of its orientation and in terms of its uh, layout, its uh, footprint, uh, I bet any, quote, Protestant congregation, even yours, would be uh, feel that it's a film, familiar space, a comfortable space. Here's a, uh, another church building I participated in. This one is in Greensburg, uh, Pennsylvania, where the baptismal font and the altar are on the same axis to, uh, to celebrate the intimacy of those two sacraments. So it seems to me, as somebody who loves being in your presence, for example, but also feels himself to be a completely Roman Catholic Christian today, that the question that's left to all of us is this one. If we're truly one people or one body in Christ, as St. Paul calls us, what's preventing us from gathering at one table beneath the common roof? And of course, we'd have to spend about 15 weeks talking about that one. And maybe it simply has to do with listening to each other more carefully. I watched you folks talk last week about claiming solidarity with LGBTQ people in our community. Maybe we also have to extend the same kind of courtesy to each other who are in the fold, in the body of Christ. And I know that you're very uh, involved in ecumenical dialogue. I know that recently you, you've had services at the Jewish synagogue and at the Catholic church uh, there in Manhattan Beach. Can we imagine an architecture that'll help Christians of all stripes worship together as one? Now. <laughs> I don't know if we even have time before your service for us to address that, but do you think we ever could come together in one place, one time, one kind of architecture, or is that too difficult uh, a task for us to achieve or to address? Anyone, anyone want to be bold enough to launch mm -hmm. into that one? Or what would it take? What would it take for all of us to gather at the same table? Well, sometimes I wonder if it's the hierarchy of the church. That I agree. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That causes and, and, separation because I, I'm guessing that most people would love um, being on the same elevation and looking at each other and having more of a sense of equality that way. I, I agree. I'll think about it. I mean, we just think that somebody says this is the way it should be because <laughs> it's the and we say, okay. Exactly. It's not that important to general lay people. I right. Get and, and what's your name? What's your name? Your first name? Rosie. Rosie? That's my mom's name. I, I agree with you. And I think that, um, you know, the hierarchy, to use your word, gets in the way all the time. You know, institutions are in the business of perpetuating themselves. And I'll tell you, the Catholic clergy doesn't want to give up power. I, I find myself being patronized all the time by Catholic clergy I know. And always when I'm in their presence, I'll drop a line or two to make them know that I know as much as they do about their own faith. Um, and I think, Rosie, that what we're doing even this morning is really important. If you and I keep on from the personal level, from the, from the level of the pews. If we keep on ins insisting um, on ecumenism and dialogue across these silly boundaries, eventually we'll, we'll, we'll reach that place. And because um, we have to, it's such a scandal that we go on as the Christian, the body of Christ, we, we go on being fractured from each other. And it breaks my heart to think that all week long, I've been thinking about you folks I even prayed at you at morning mass every morning this week. I really believe in inter intercessory prayer. Isn't it sad that I can pray for you, you can pray for me, but somehow we can't come together at the same table. Um, maybe we'll have to keep pricking the conscience of the hierarchy in, in each of our denominations and have them relinquish some of their power to the laity. But uh, seems like you folks, you folks at Manhattan Beach, you really have, um, I won't say the run of the place, but you certainly have an active role to play in how things uh, transpire in terms of your service and, uh, and what, what takes place there. And uh, one last comment, any more comments before you go off to, to worship? 
Oh, yeah. One time we did learn about a community of different religions. Uh, right. We're, we're praying, well, live together, share yeah. communities. Uh, sure. I guess we could all, we could all become Unitarian, <laughs> but there might be some issues involved there too. I don't know, but um, all I know is that, and I'll tell you personally. Again, I I love being with you every Sunday. You might think it's really peculiar that in such a short amount of time, I've grown attached to all of you. It means a lot to, to me that you allow me to come into your fellowship hall there, spew all this thing from a Catholic perspective, but. Uh, that you're willing to accept what I have to say, think about what I have to say. It's, it's humbling to me and something that I thoroughly enjoy doing. And uh, next week, of course, I'm kind of excited to share with you um, a little bit about the, uh, the, the crush building that I do. I hope you'll come back and learn a little bit about nativity scenes, nativity sets. But uh, after we're done next week, I'm, gonna, I'm going to kind of miss you, and, uh, but I will continue to keep you in my prayers. But uh, Enjoy your service. I would like to say one thing. Oh, one more question? Yeah, I have a niece who took architect. Uh, she got her degree in in uh, church architect. And I was really? wondering at the time, yes. And I was wondering at the time, why would she why would she pick that particular type of uh, career to and uh, she's been in it for now 10 or 12 yeah. years and uh, but well, I mean, for our, a lot of different reasons, you take up something like that. But it's very interesting. Well, if you think about it, there are a few architectural types today, types of buildings that have as much meaning as churches, right? I mean, everybody's designing warehouses. Everybody's designing throwaway architecture for the suburbs and for retail districts and malls and so forth. But churches still have meaning for us, churches and libraries and places of government. So where did she go to school, ma'am? In the uh, University of uh, Michigan. Oh, okay, great, great, great. University of Michigan. Good school. Well, you uh, folks have a great service. I'll be watching you, okay? Thank you, Dr. Thank, well, thank you. You all be good, see ya. Oh, next week is two weeks uh, from now. We've got the League of Women Voters discussing the proposition. So mark your calendars. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.